Uh, please let me uh, introduce uh, Kelvin uh, Long. He is the research director of the Interstellar Research Center uh, in Tail, England. Yeah, I hope I pronounced that correctly. And uh, he's going to speak to us about the emergence of a fusion propulsion capability this century and implications for exploration and settlement strategies. So, um, yeah, uh, the seminar is all yours, mm -hmm. and I will close my camera, but share your presentation. So, we're here with you. Welcome, everybody. Um, so, as was introduced, I'll be talking about fusion propulsion capability, um, particularly in the century ahead of us and in the solar system and beyond. So, um, just wait for the slides to come up. Here we go. Okay, so we go to the next slide. So I've just introduced very briefly the Interstellar Research Centre, um, which is essentially an organisation that's interested in developing technologies to take us to the stars, um, spacecraft, starship technologies. Um, there are two particular interests with this. The first is obviously exploration and colonisation and settlement of the solar system and beyond taking us to the planets, taking us to the stars. And second is mitigation of potential existential threats, whatever they may be. So the obvious one is near Earth asteroids. And obviously, if you have a, an advanced propulsion capability, you can mitigate those threats much easier. So as you can see on the current slide, we have um, the solar system going outwards um, past the asteroid belt, past the Oort cloud, all the way to the stars. And essentially that's my primary interest is getting humanity out into the universe. As Elon Musk often talks about making humanity interplanetary as a species. But I want to make us interstellar. So we go to the next slide. Now there are lots of propulsion methods to achieve that from laser beams, solar cells and other methods. But I'm particularly interested in fusion because it's near term. Um, some of the earliest fusion work occurred in the 1960s. Some of the papers cited below on the slide there. And essentially what you've got is he hydrogen and helium isotopes um, being heated up to a point where they can overcome the Coulomb barrier, um, like they do in the sun. In the sun, you have proton-proton fusion. Um, and with hydrogen and helium isotopes, they react together and they produce products, the charged particles of which you can magnetically direct in a thrust chamber. And this gives you thrust. And essentially, the way we achieve this in the particular method I'm interested in is inertial confinement fusion, where you take small capsules or pellets of fusion fuel, you inject them into a target chamber, you use laser beams to compress them down to essentially create a star, a miniature star, and then they produce charged particles, which you direct using large magnetic fields. That's why you need a magnetic nozzle. Next slide, please. Now, one of the earliest laser experiments on Earth was the US Nova laser, and I, it was quite low in energy, around 100 kilojoules, four terawatts peak power. So that's the, the, the energy delivered to the target. And this didn't, of, of course, achieve ignition. But I like this diagram because it kind of shows the thinking. Um, if you look, look at this, you've got a whole laser bank with the amplifiers and the spatial filters um, all separated out. And in behind it, you've got a reaction chamber. And I like this diagram because it kind of looks a bit like a propulsion engine. And that's the idea that we're thinking of. Next slide. Now, since NOVA, this actually went into the design of NIF, the National Ignition Facility in San Francisco. And in 2022, they actually achieved ignition in a laboratory the first time on Earth. They got a gain of about 1.5 which is not significant. Um, you know, the, the laser energy efficiency is quite low, less than a percent, um, but it's still a very significant physics achievement. And uh, they have since gone even further. They've got to a gain of about three. That means three times more energy has come out of the capsule and has gone in to drive it. And you can see NIFs are rather large structure. It's the size of a football field. Um, and essentially they've got these small capsules of um, deuterium and tritium um, because it has a low cross section inside this target chamber. Um, two marigajoules delivered to the target around 500 terawatts of peak power and they're able to produce ignition and obviously the next step after this is can we build a fusion reactor to power the national electrical grid of a, of a city next slide 
there's been lots of problems with getting to ignition, lots of physics issues. Uh, one of the main issues is instabilities, hydrodynamic instabilities. And you can see here some beautiful images of target shots from the 1990s. And you can see the asymmetries in the implosion as the plasma is compressing up towards its high temperature, high high density compression state, which is what you need for fusion. And essentially, uh, one of the other issues is the laser plasma instabilities. As you go to high laser energy, those laser plasma instabilities increase. Um, and um, this, this is one of the main sort of issues, obstacles towards getting to fusion. But we think we understand a lot of these problems now. And so it looks like there is now a pathway towards fusion reactors. Next slide, please. There are lots of different types of fuels you can use in a fusion engine. I mentioned deuterium tritium is what they use in the reactors. Um, for propulsion, we're more interested in a neutronic reactions. That is the reactions that produce very few neutrons. Deuterium and helium-3 is one of the primary reactions for that because it produces helium-4, alpha particles, and protons, which are both charged. There are very few neutrons. Um, there are neutrons from the side reactions because the deuterium will react with itself. And any neutrons are bad because they radiate the spacecraft structure, which means you need shielding, which is increased mass. And you can see from the equation at the bottom, there's a term called alpha. And the alpha is essentially the mass defect. That's the difference between the uh, mass of the um, two products you use to generate the reaction and the mass of the re reactants that, that, that goes into it. So that difference gives you a value for helium-3 it's um, about 0 0.0039, for example. And that multiplies by another time called, term called phi, which is the burn-up fraction. That's how efficiently you're compressing those, those fuels. Um, square root of that times C gives you essentially exhaust velocity. That's the velocity of the charged particles coming out of your fuel. And then there's another term there, which is theta, which is the divergence half angle of the nozzle. So that's how well quality your jet is. Essentially what you want is that exhaust velocity to be as high as possible and that goes into what's called the ideal rocket equation. Next slide. And one of the things I've done is to develop these what are called driving equations to design fusion propulsion systems. So if we just take the first one, that's the thrust, and you've got the M cap is the, the capsule mass of the fusion fuel, F hertz is the pulse frequency, that's how many you're detonating per second, um, MW is a momentum weighting factor based on the mean mass of the ions in your plasma um, and you can see the other terms of what I just showed you and you can play around with these equations to determine um, what's the optimum parameters for the design of your engine and the ones at the bottom the m cap tells you the mass of the capsule as a function of the propulsion parameters the driver energy that how, how much energy you need to get into that target to produce ignition and gain and then the efficiency of your engine those are really critical parameters now, one of the um, definitive studies was VISTA, um, which was produced by Lawrence Livermore scientists. And this was a concept for Mars missions, human crewed, to get to Mars in roughly 100 to 150 days, carrying around 100 tons of payload, um, including people. And this was a really innovative concept, except that it assumed a gain of 1500, which is not really realistic. Could be in the far future, but we don't think that's realistic at the moment. So I'm more interested in incredible concepts. Next slide, please. Um, another exotic concept was the British Interplanetary Society Project Daedalus in the 1970s. This was actually designed for an interstellar probe. It's a flyby probe designed to go to Barnard Star in about 50 years. And this uses electron beams to implode capsules in a large reaction chamber, but it requires about 50 tons. 50,000 tonnes of deuterium helium-3. Next slide, please. The deuterium helium-3, of course, the helium-3 is not abundant on the Earth, and so you need to go to the gas giants to receive that, which has implications for when you could launch such missions in the future, because you need to build up the architecture first. So this is just showing you an illustration of Daedalus, um, and I, I like to think about interstellar starship design as extreme aerospace engineering, because everything you're dealing with, temperature, density, um, velocity, everything is extreme power energy and so um but there's no reason although we can't build these things today there's no reason we can't develop the concepts as a concept design configuration next slide please <clears throat> so you can play around with daedalus for example you can play around with multi-staging single stage say to four stage but there's a limit of diminishing returns of staging but you can get a bit more energy out to get to go slightly faster for your payload what you're essentially trying to do with uh, starship engineering is get a maximum payload to your target for as minimum ma uh, propellant mass as possible and spacecraft mass as possible next slide 
<clears throat> so when I started playing around with design, redesigning Daedalus, this is showing you two examples. One is Endeavor, which is a parallel thrust system, which uses a five engine nozzle, a bit like the Saturn V Quintec engines. And then the one at the bottom is a flyby probe called Resolution, which uses a single engine, can actually do it at about 2000 tons of deuterium helium free. So these are the sort of concepts I've been playing around with. Next slide, please. And what it's led to is a concept called Pegasus. Again, you can see it here with its kind of orthographic layout with its different views. Next slide. And Pegasus is an interstellar probe also. In other words, it's a, it's a robotic probe, not human, but it will take around 150 tons of science payload to the stars. It's designed to go to Proxima Centauri in about 100 years. And uh, it, it looks, you know, from a physics perspective, it looks Credible, but it's lots of engineering issues. And you can see that the, the dominant features in this is the radiators, because I mentioned those neutrons that are coming out and also X-rays from Bromstrahlin radiation. The fins at the back, the big radiator fins at the back, they're actually for the engines. And you can see the radiators in the middle are much bigger. And that's because the lasers themselves get hot and uh, you need to cool them and you need to get rid of that excess heat. Next slide, please. And this is showing Pegasus again. You can clearly see those big radiators and you can see the propellant tanks at the front. Um, we've deliberately separated the payload from the engine, of course, because you want to keep the scientific instruments far away from all that damaging radiation. Um, and it's actually also the same with the propellant tanks because the propellant can heat up as well. So you want to keep those separated from the engine. So next slide, please. <clears throat> And you can see here another um, illustration of Pegasus from the back. Now you start to see the engine design at the back. And all of those little circles are essentially the beamline holes. So you'd have um, an array of lasers circular around the target chamber in each of those engine nozzles. And they would be um, you know, firing X number of times per second to set off these tiny little pellets um, as a pulse, nuclear pulse system. Next slide. <clears throat> And the problem with a design like this is you really need to go to much higher pellet masses. So when you're talking about stuff at NIF, National Ignition Facility, you're talking about milligrams. Um, but here I'm going much larger, so 72 milligrams and 28.8 milligrams. And these require very higher drive energies. Remember NIF was two megajoules. So now we're talking about 145 megajoules, 73 megajoules. So this really puts it into the future rather than the immediate present. Next slide, please. And this is just showing Pegasus in its glory with the hopefully collimated engines. So the more divergent that beam on the engines, the less efficient the engine is. Next slide, please. And here you can see Pegasus traveling off to the stars. And that is ultimately where we want to get to, is to launch interstellar probes. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, one of the things I've started to look at is an interstellar roadmap. So that is to get to Pegasus, um, you first of all have to demonstrate um, other technologies on the pathway. So I've actually costed Pegasus, um, which is the, the first interstellar rendezvous probe to an interstellar mission. Um, I've done what's called the capital expenditure model. And essentially I've split it up into research and development, construction and production, and the mission utilization phase. And there's also an additional factor which you have to take into consideration, which is the cost of the helium free. At the moment, you might be looking at something like $1,400 per, um, per gram for helium-free mining. Um, but actually, um, we needed to come down to something like $0.1 um, dollars per gram. Um, and then the mission becomes affordable. Pegasus rendezvous mission, I uh, cap it out at around $70 billion is what it would cost. Sounds a lot of money, but if it's split over many years, many decades, it's not so much. And if you look at this program that I've developed, which starts from the ground demonstrators of de developing ignition all the way through to solar system um, interplanetary exploration missions to um, post Voyager missions to 100,000 AU and so forth. Um, and you get to, to Pegasus, um, I've costed this program about $300 billion over 100 years. And then after that, you can go up to human crewed missions, which is not included in that cost model. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> So I just mentioned the human cruise missions that might be possible. This is something called a slow boat. It takes about 200 people on board. The population grows over 60 years where it's traveling about 10% of the speed of light to get to the nearest stars. This is something that may be possible in the future once you've done the flyby and the rendezvous missions for the robotic probes. Next slide, please. 
And then after that, you can actually start to talk about world ships. World ships are massive, sort of 10 to the power of 11, 10 to the power of 12 um, kilogram structures. They are huge, um, require like a thousand engines on the back to push them because they're so heavy. But essentially small moons um, that you're pushing um, over many centuries to the stars, but could take maybe a million people or more on a long journey to, to the distant stars. And that might be something we can do at some point in the distant future, um, especially with AI and self-replication technology um, and asteroid mining all coupled together. We could do these things perhaps rather quickly. Next slide, please. One of the issues, of course, is how you construct such large machines. And this is why you need space architecture. You need cheap access to Earth orbit. And, um, you know, that's where the, the SpaceX program really comes into it. And we really need those missions to come down to something like $10 million per launch. Um, that would be um, really something. And it would open up um, space massively to humankind. And then we could start to think about how we build such structures. Next slide, please. Now, um, just to take a bit of a detour and to think about um, the implication of these roadmaps, this is a, uh, a screen grab of an image I took yesterday of all of the ships on the ocean of the Earth. And the um, you can see um, there's a lot of uh, ships there. This doesn't include small boats, of course, it's just the ships. But we've got to think about the geopolitical situation on Earth today with all the different, na different nation states, hopefully working together with the United Nations and dominated by the permanent members, of course, with their veto. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, issues. There's the laws of the sea, but there's a lot of uh, some nations um, claiming territory over certain waters on the earth. Um, and this is creating frictions between nations, of course. Now, there's no reason to think that if we're going to merge into space and start establishing colonies on other worlds in our solar system in the near future, the moon, Mars, the asteroid belt, Phobos, Dimas, for example, that if those geopolitical differences still exist on Earth, then they will also mirror into space. Despite the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, um, how will nations work and cooperate or even compete together in space? Next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, recently there was a, a very good uh, publication, um, State of the Space Industrial Base in 2021, uh, where the author said demonstration of advanced propulsion capability would be a key enabler for quick expansion and proliferation of sizzling infrastructure. I entirely agree. Um, advanced space propulsion capability is really important um, for very, very many reasons. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so here's a hypothetical scenario. This is completely fiction, so don't take it too seriously. Um, but here's a, a rough map of the solar system with the planets and their orbits. And what you can see I've done is I've color-coded um, different allegiances. So you can imagine human beings are living on the moon, living on Mars, living in the asteroid belt, perhaps some of the moons of Saturn, like Titan, for example, and they've become independent. There are some dependencies still on Earth um, for trade and for resources, but some of them have become fully dependent in the future, um, independent, and some of them will form their own alliances. Perhaps, you know, when once Elon establishes uh, his wonderful city on Mars, um, and they establish full autonomy, um, what would their allegiances be to Earth? Um, would we be essentially two worlds working together or two worlds competing together? These are the sorts of issues, I think, that space policy needs to start thinking about. Um, and so you can see here, I've just color-coded um, hypothetical scenarios for how different colonies may be distributed around the solar system. Next slide, please. So one of the things I started to think about is rather than just thinking about interstellar, which tends to usually get my interest, is the nearer term. And so uh, NASA um, around 2000 developed this wonderful concept called Discovery 2, which is a spherical Taurus magnetic fusion spacecraft to take 172 tons human crew payload to Jupiter and Saturn in around 200 days or so. And so I've started to redesign that, but with ICF propulsion. Go to the next slide, please. And this is called Discovery Free. And so this also carries the same human crew payload, but uses an inertial confinement fusion engine, just like NIF. Um, the technology looks very difficult at the moment. Probably don't want to use optical flash pump lasers like NIF. Maybe you want to go to um, sort of superconducting diode-based lasers, perhaps. That might be better, because um, they're not limited to the same instabilities. Um, go to the next slide. And I've also started to look at um, post-Voyager missions. So this is the Sun Voyager, 
a couple of papers published in Journal of Spacecraft and Rockets. This takes 100 tons to 1,000 AU, mainly for an astronomical mission to observe exoplanets using the gravitational focus mission. But these are sorts of architectures we need to start developing to think about where humankind is going to be in the next 10, 20, 50, 100 years. Um, and uh, developing these vehicle architectures with high payload masses with rapid transport velocity mode is really important. Next slide. And as you can see, with the roads map I kind of developing, it starts from the ground demonstrations, the inertia confinement, and the other, you know, I'm not, not necessarily wedded to inertia confinement. There's the mentioned the spherical tokamax, but there's other ways of doing fusion, um, which uh, several private companies are currently exploring. But then there's the development of the robotic missions that take us around the solar system, out into the Oort cloud and beyond, leads to the interstellar missions, flyby and then rendezvous. And then there is the crewed missions, um, which takes us to Mars, to the outer gas giants, and then eventually um, on interstellar missions. And this is really, I think, the vision we want to be working towards, although it may take several centuries to get there. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, um, fusion propulsion is on the horizon uh, because we've now achieved it on Earth. There used to be this old saying, fusion is always 50 years away. Um, well, we've now achieved fusion on Earth. That's been done in a laboratory for the first time in history. So we understand the physics of how to do it. Now it's a question of efficiency and how easily we can do it, how much energy we can get out. So um, the future looks bright in terms of fusion. And I think we need to develop technology pathways for how we develop these sorts of machines. There's a lot of technologies we haven't really developed beyond the conceptual phase, such as the heat radiators, uh, magnetic nozzles, um, the superconducting magnetic field coils, induction loops, all kinds of technologies, which I feel organizations like NASA, but also uh, private industry should be focusing on um, so that that technology maturates to the right technology at this level in the next 20, 30 years. And I think provided we do that, the solar system is open to us. And ultimately the stars are also open to us as the ultimate endpoint of the astronautical endeavor. And I think that's the last slide. And I'll take any questions for the first time. Let's have a look first of all at the chat. So, um, okay. If anyone's got any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Yeah, we have time like maybe for one question. Uh, so please go ahead and write it down. And in the meanwhile, I think we have uh, one question in the Uva platform. So I will go and uh, paste it right on the on the chat. Or if you prefer, I can just read it. Sure. And I can also answer the other questions later in the in the app. I'll do that later on. OK. What oh, OK. Vision? So yeah. I, can you uh, read the chat? I can. What is your vision in shaping the development trend of future research development, promoting the integration process of space program, expanding the ties of implementation of joint research? Well, I really like the SpaceX model. Um, they received government assistance in the early days. Um, and then once they got to a self-sustainable position, um, the government let them go. And now they're, okay, the government's still a client, um, but they are self-funded and um, they are, have their own businesses. And I think that model of government working with commercial enterprise in the early stages to develop technologies is really critical, particularly for SMEs who really need funding. and um, this enables technologies to get off the ground and then that can then be taken to the cap venture capitalist investors or otherwise to build um you know for profitable companies so i think that's important in technology development but also linking up with um universities who are doing innovative research and how you move from just theoretical and numerical analysis phase to actually building stuff which can then be put into you know mi actual missions and tested and I, I think i'd like to see space move into more of an experimentation phase as spacex is doing with uh, its its rockets with starship as, as it did with falcon allowing for failures um, i think this is a much quicker route to technology development instead of only putting stuff into missions once you know, they've achieved you know readiness level that's necessary i mean you learn a lot from failures and that that's something i, I favor as a pathway uh awesome thank you uh finally we have one more uh question that i missed sorry for that uh, it's also in the chat it says mm -hmm. 
Is there a trend to support researchers using oh, I lose, uh, using space data in hydrological and climate change studies? Um, I'm not. I'm not. I don't know. I mean, I suppose there is. Um, it's not my field. I'm. I'm. I mean, I'm mostly a, a propulsion guy. Um, so, um, obviously, there are academics working in those areas, particularly with you know satellites in space, observing Earth, observing the climates of other planets tells us a lot, and those should continue. Uh, I'm not quite sure I answered the question, but I didn't really understand the question. Um, do you think the moon? Means helium free can be used until we can reach the gas giants. Um, yes, but it's about a million tons of helium free on the moon. But my issue with that is digging up all that regolith. It's actually quite an expensive enterprise, and I'm not I, I'm not sure uh, we want to do that on mass. Um, maybe for small quantities, but I think for on mass we really need to build up a gas giant mining infrastructure. Um, yeah. Do you want me to answer more, or do you want to? How are we doing for time? Uh, we have one more minute, maybe one more uh, question. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Have you considered implosion versus explosion technology for propulsion? Um, I presume you're referring to nuclear pulse propulsion, like Project Orion. Um, yes, um, Project Orion's limited um, in its a specific impulse, um, and it's mainly due to the shock absorbers uh, that limits the pulse frequency, and also the angle that's subtended by the detonation. So the products will hit the back of the pressure plate, but a lot of it is wasted. Um, what's better is if you have a target chamber, like a hemispherical shell, um, and you can detonate capsules rapidly, at high pulse frequency, you can capture a lot more of that energy. And so it's more of an efficient process. So I, I tend to think that's, that's a, ultimately it's down to efficiency, um, how much energy you can get out, because that then affects the velocity you can achieve and what mass you can carry. Wow, okay. So thank you, Dr. Kelvin Long, for this uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you, everyone, for attending the session. And yeah, uh, this is a good time for a short break. We have five minutes before our next uh, sessions, OK? So see you around in the conference. <laughs>